But before any of that happens, build an image. You've got your image, and then it's the same on every single system. So you can be guaranteed that the uh, image that's used to run your unit tests is the exact same image that eventually makes it up in production, which makes this extremely powerful. You don't have to worry about things failing in production when you follow the proper procedure there. So it doesn't matter how you do it, but automate it, because otherwise it's kind of a management nightmare. So to kind of sum it up, I think you've got the idea of containers you know, making them relatively easy to use. Um, they aren't a terribly difficult concept. It's no more difficult than running a VM. It's just a matter of how you use them, how you install your libraries, and maintaining a consistent workflow even between developers on your team. Make sure that developer A is making Docker containers one way, developer B is making them the exact same way, so that at the end of the day, troubleshooting is not a problem. The downside to this is that they can introduce extra complexity. Like I said, it's a great tool, it has a lot of uses, but like anything, use it in moderation, use it appropriately. Um, I don't think there's one tool out there that you can say, yep, we're going to use this all the time. And Docker fits in as well. If you've got a load balancer, you do not want to stick a load balancer in a Docker container because it's a high amount of network traffic. It's just not a good idea. So be careful where you use Docker containers because it might not be the best case in all circumstances. Any questions? Any additional questions? Yes. Yeah. So say you were making a LAMP stack. Mm -hmm. Would you have three separate Dockers then? One for PHP, one for um, MySQL, and one for your Apache server? It would depend. Uh, there's different theories about how you can create t containers. <coughs> You could actually create a container with all those things in one. Mm -hmm. um, personally, I would never put uh, anything that's going to be long-term storage inside of a Docker container. So don't put the MySQL part of that or your database portion of that inside of a Docker container. You can, certainly. Uh, probably just not the best idea to do so for performance reasons, especially if it's going to be seeing a large amount of traffic. Typically, you would put like Apache and your PHP on the same uh, server, mainly because of the way Apache and PHP interact. Same with uh, Node and Nginx, if you guys are in that platform. Uh, I would put both of those on the same server, Nginx and Django, if you're doing that as well. Um, so try not to separate those processes, but be careful. Um, just because you're putting them all in one container, you don't want to go overboard with it. So uh, just be careful. I would say make sure that at least you're not putting the database in the database. <laughs> They're meant to be blown away at some point, so I assume you don't want your database going. Yeah. Um, for AWS orchestration, are you using um, CloudFormation scripts? Yes. Well, kind of. We're actually using uh, Terraform, if you okay. yeah. Yeah. Uh It's kind of the same idea. <clears throat> so you're all AWS except for that? Except for? Terraform instead of CloudFormation? Yes. Okay. yes. Is there a particular reason? Because. Um, when we actually set up uh, initially with Amazon, we didn't create things with CloudFormation templates. And uh, if you're not familiar with trying to get existing Amazon resources under CloudFormation control, it just doesn't work. Okay. So Terraform allowed us to use uh, some of our existing resources and kind of program those. So if you were starting cool. now, like with new resources, CloudFormation all the way. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So when you run that, like, the RM command to remove things, does that blow away all of the data that's been inputted since you started it? Yep. Yep. So basically those containers are prepackaged. Every time you start up a container, you get a copy of the image itself. So if your image is running and it's doing some sort of process that's spitting out data, make sure you're storing that data in some place, whether that's exporting your file system and storing it off there, whether it's storing it into a database, make sure that you're doing something valuable to stick that data someplace. <coughs> you stop that container, um, I believe if you stop it, the data still exists. If you remove it, it doesn't. So be careful with that. Yeah. What's the difference between a Docker file and a Docker Compose file? Um, so Docker Compose is kind of, uh, if you look at the different types of orchestration platforms, Docker Compose was kind of a step towards this in the 
very beginning. So a Docker file um, uh, defines the image itself. A composed file says how do images or how do containers interact with each other. So for in, in the example of maybe spinning up a LAMP stack inside of a Docker file or instead inside the Docker environment, <clears throat> you might have a Docker file for Apache and MySQL. You might have a Docker file for, uh, or sorry, uh, Apache and PHP, and you might have a Docker file for P uh, MySQL. The way those two containers interact would be defined inside the Docker Compose file. Okay, so if you have multiple things like that that you're pulling into right. one file, that, yeah. I mean that's that's like the approved way to do it. Not create a new Docker file that then references these images uh, of these yes. other Docker files. <laughs> that would be correct because you want your containers to be reusable, right? Right. So you don't want to just build one container that only references another container. In fact, I don't know that there's a way to do that inside the Docker file. If I remember. Um, so really, you use that. You build each component to act on its own, and then you connect them together with either a compose file or you do a larger orchestration tool like this. Any other questions? Yeah. Are your developers actually uh, like running their code locally in a Docker file and editing code and running and looking at things? Jason. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we do all our development. Like normal on our machines and, and stuff, but what what we've done then is we will have Docker on the machine, and we can we can upload that and, and run the image and, and test it that way. And what's nice is we can then ship that to him, or ship that up to wherever we're hosting it. Or, but you're not actually running your site in Docker on your local machine, huh? You're not actually running your app in Docker on your local machine. Not not what we're, de we're developing. Why not? In development, for development, your mileage may vary. Yeah. Uh, uh, in our, my team, there's there's a lot of moving parts. You're looking at Redis. You're looking at uh, Postgres. You're looking at Ruby on Rails. You're looking at Angular. Uh, but we also have members of the team. Some are working on MacBooks. Some are working in natively in Linux. Uh, unfortunately, <coughs> Docker, particularly in in uh, the Mac world isn't really up to par. There are some things in our development environment that we do run in containers, uh, such as Redis and, and uh, the database and our instance of Solar. But what we found is because of the way Docker interfaces with the underlying file system, uh, you don't, uh, it's, when you're going and changing files, you don't want to have to constantly be restarting your container. So you need your container to look at the file system and let it react to that. Unfortunately, uh, with Ruby on Rails, it is, and especially when executing tests and stuff, it's incredibly slow compared to just running uh, Rails interactively right. through the command line. Uh, meanwhile, the Linux folks are able to do everything in containers, and it all runs great. Okay. So it, it, it's, it's basically situational depending on how I've run into that, and I, I mean, I've seen a lot of progress being made on yeah. that, making the OSX file system better with Docker. Right. I don't know it, if you've it, tried it recently, yet. but it's not, it's not there yet, you're saying? Uh, well, I mean, they're, they're coming up with releases periodically. Um, <laughs> most of our Mac users have just transitioned to Linux because they were tired okay. of it. So they've given up on it, but... Like in the last and six I don't run, months, it, I, don't run it. I still have a MacBook, but I don't run it off often okay. enough to attest to either I'm not in active <coughs> development. And there's a reason I did all my demos on a Linux VM. <coughs> now, that being said, they just had a release last week. Okay. So they changed the versioning number. So if you hear like Docker 1.14 or whatever, the that no longer exists. <laughs> well, as of Friday, it changed too. <laughs> yeah. Now it's community, that? community and enterprise as right. of Friday. Right, so now you'll see things based on year month, kind of like Ubuntu does with their versions. So right now the current version of Docker is actually 17.03, 17.03. So you might want to check out, because I think um, when I installed the latest version, they changed the virtualization engine that they use. They don't use VirtualBox anymore for emulating uh, a Docker host. It uses its own internal um, lightweight VM. So you might want to try it again, see if anything changed from last week. Okay. But there is definitely a reason I did that on the next week. 
Yeah. Yeah, the reason why I asked was um, uh, it was mostly because of debugging. Because like, like in Ruby or something, you have the debug port, I can still open up the port, no problem, attach my debugger. But for stuff like .NET, which you guys were doing, yeah. um, there's not really, it's kind of attaching to a process, not attaching to a port. So yeah, I would recommend if you're going to do de uh, development, don't do it inside of a Docker container. Ship it up to your development environment in a Docker container. Don't necessarily do that on the local, because you're going to run into a lot of problems. Like you said, you have to rebuild those disk images at any time a file changes. So that could get into a little bit of a tedious workflow, unless you've got some like, you know, 50 core system that I'm not aware of yet. And then maybe, you know, some super fast SSDs, maybe. But I would say definitely want to work on developing like you always would. But use this as a tool to be able to ship code around rather than saying, like, this is the end all, you know, for development. Actually, uh, oh, if you install Docker tools for Visual Studio, you actually can hit breakpoints in Docker That's cool. containers. That's fun. Because even if you do build the container, you're like, crap, what's in this container? I want, I want, like, I want, because it's the thing going to prod, breaking, I want to be able to debug that thing. You know, so that's pretty simple. Yeah. If you install the Docker tools or Visual Studio, you know the little uh, drop down where you can pick debug or production? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It adds another drop down that's Docker or <laughs> IIS. That's pretty sweet. Yeah, I think Microsoft. <laughs> uh, I, mean, I was using the regular Visual Studio. Okay. I'm not sure if they could. Microsoft's done a lot of work in the area of Docker, not only on their operating systems. Uh, actually, uh, just this past week, I was able to build you know, our .NET 4.5 applications inside of a Docker container running Windows Nano. I definitely saw some performance issues with that. That was, that was a little bit slow. And uh, if you happen to notice the 128 megabyte, you know, Docker image that we had, that's, that's pretty nice. The base image for the older legacy apps and the older .NET stuff running under IIS 10 is 8 gigabytes. So, there's a little bit size difference there. And if you're going to be shipping these things around, just be aware of that. If you're shipping Windows containers, they are going to be a little bit larger. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to beat this into the ground, but we're, we're currently using, so all of our LAMP sites, we're building in Vagrant, which okay. is a nightmare. Um, and so Docker's fantastic, and we've tried it on a couple sites, and the performance is great locally. All we're doing is syncing a folder to a folder, so a local folder, to the to the container folder. Okay. I mean, R do you guys have R sync? You, uh, doing like R sync. Uh, I mean, basically, like yeah. with with Vagrant R sync, mm -hmm. um, and with Docker, I believe it's also R sync. Are you building that into the image, or are you using? There's a dash. V it's just a sync, so it's syncing okay. my local file system right. into Docker. Okay. So when I update a file, um, I mean, it the, the file's there live inside the Docker container. Right. Are you guys seeing? Downsides to that, or were you talking about actually building an image? I'm, I'm just talking about PHP, which would just run an uncompiled language. Well, that was that was kind of the issue: the the container being in, in sync with the the file system, whether it was R sync and there were other options, but none of them. It, it would it would update the container, but it it was slow. I, I mean, running, for example, a unit test suite in uh, container was mm. it, it was orders of magnitude slower. Wow. Now, Incredibly yeah, frustrating. I, I think something must have changed because I'm I'm running a Docker instance, changing files locally, and they're instantly changing in the container. So what you're doing in that case, there's a, uh, just like you could expose a port to the host operating system, you can actually expose folders from your right. host inside of your Docker container. And I have a feeling that's probably what you're doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you can basically say, hey, take this app folder and put it inside of the Docker container. It's like a similar almost. Right. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it <coughs> simulates kind of a file system inside of a file system on that. And that can be good for certain things, but I wouldn't recommend, if you're going to use this as a, a way to ship code around, right. make sure your Docker container holds the files that you're shipping around. Right. Don't sync up your files and then run a Docker process separate. Make right. sure those files are inside of the Docker. Okay, that makes sense. <clears throat> at, at hardware. Sure. So you, I saw when you, you know, interface with the, uh, the the network interface. Mm -hmm. What if my application needed to access the printer? Would I get it explicit like the default printer if I was using the Windows? You know. So 
uh, I would be careful with how low level you get. If you're in, if, if a printer is, for example, something that you would want to do with this, um, you actually have to run a separate command to make these Docker containers privileged. So by default, they're not going to have access to anything the host OS. Okay. But if you would want to expose like a lower level thing, you would have to. There's a flag that you can add when you okay. run the containers. It's certainly doable. Uh, I would stick to web applications or things that run on a daily, nightly basis, some sort of periodic tasks, that sort of thing. Okay. Do you have a question as well? Yeah, so like the Docker containers, I, I imagine, you know, every container will have like, you know, its own life within the organization. So how do you keep track of what changed? Or is there some like simple way to like figure out Oh yeah, you know, five revisions forward, you know, this was the change that was made. So is there any provision natively in Docker to provide that kind Unfortunately, of Unfortunately not in Docker itself. Okay. And that's why I stress the automation portion of it. Mm -hmm. When you look at the history of a Docker container, you're just gonna get version numbers. Probably not that helpful. If you've got some sort of situation like this where you've got an integrated pipeline, developers are checking code into Git you are going to be able to say the build server kicked off and it grabbed these changes from Git and it took an image with those things. So in that case it would, but natively Docker by itself doesn't have that uh, build into it. So yeah, definitely automation is, is a must there. Cool. And we would, you know, in our company we haven't got to that point yet, but this would, I'd be, you know, I'm sure Jason Dobbs would love that, but uh, that's a little bit down the road for us. Even. Anything else? Awesome. Well, thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, appreciate you guys coming.